Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. So on the show today, Steve Hoshkinson. So Steve is uh, joining us from the Bay Area. He founded a school of trauma, a trauma therapy, trauma work called Organic Intelligence. Uh, he's responsible for a podcast called The End of Trauma, which is a, a really nice one. He's got a background, really long, deep background in all kinds of uh, trauma work, such as Eric Erickson, Pete Levine's work. Just, I've been looking at some of this guy's stuff online, and I think we're going to have a great, a great conversation. So, Steve, welcome. Thanks so much, Mark. I've been so looking forward to actually uh, having a chance to talk together. Yeah, I think we missed each other at JFK University when I went to see um, Professor Wong there. And I've uh, been looking, you know, it looks like you're really on the lead edge of trauma. Before we get into that, though, let's let's go back. What's your journey with the body? How did you get interested in the body? I know you've got a strong body background. Well, yeah, you know, it really uh, came about when I was in graduate school in clinical psychology. And and somehow I was looking at, at the time, we were really looking at what was called the mind-body problem. Uh, and uh, we've sort of gotten over that problem in the meantime. And I did this, uh, even did my master's thesis, which turned out to be great for uh, insomnia. Uh, it's called um, Hypnosis Increases Salivary Immunoglobulin A. And if you read it, you go right to sleep. <laughs> uh, so it per- turned out perfectly that way. But I was really trying to figure out what is this interface then between the body and the, uh, and the psyche, the soma and the psyche. And, and obviously, I, I don't know it's, if it's obvious, but for most of us, we're not too shy about saying it's also a personal journey. You know, the personal quest of integration and living more authentically uh, is what fuels it all, I think. Yeah, and I want to hear a little bit about that personal journey before we get into your work, because I, I think it places you, I was just thinking the other day, pretty much every major figure in trauma work has come out of their own trauma, um, you know, in terms of their own story. So tell us a little bit about what, what got you personally in this area before we get into the content. Well, it's just that, you know, at, uh, at, a, at a conference uh, at Esalen, Milton Traeger once stood up while everybody was pontificating about their theories. And he stood up and he said one line, he said, research is me search. And then he sat back down and he just laid it out. You know, people are sort of pretending that uh, we get into this business for yeah. some other reason. But really, it's about a personal journey. And I, like, I would look back on photos of me in, in like high school, like my driver's license, and I was just so out of it. I was just so really dissociated. And that, that you know, and dissociation, you're just sort of wondering, like, ah, something doesn't feel right, but I can't quite put my finger on it. And I really began to work through all of these traditions you know, in clinical psychology, through spiritual quests, through, you know, contemplative practice. And then really sort of finishing off with the perspective on so the somatic side of things. And, and I saw a, a, a flyer in my graduate school hall. It said healing trauma through the body. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's what they didn't talk about in uh, clinical psych school. He, the body, you know, we, we looked at somatization or uh, mm-hmm. some other things mm-hmm. like that, but really focusing on. What is it? What is this interface between the body and uh, and the healing process? And in terms of your own training background, then, so I see you were associated with somatic experiencing for a while, and Traeger, less well known perhaps to listeners. Tell us a little bit about your your training before you sort of came up with your own thing. Right. So I really began out of a contemplative approach. You know, I was really spending a, quite a bit of time in meditation retreats and so on. Uh, and then uh, took on the the academic process of clinical psychology and studying in clinical psychology and and really focusing on an academic approach. It was in the scientist practitioner model. So by the time I came to what was then this far out notion of healing trauma through the body and the somatic process, you know I was grounded in the, sort of both the contemplative practice and a science process. So the notions of Oh, we're healing through moving energy and so on. Uh, was was suspect to me, and you know, I came out of such a rigorous program that 
anything that didn't have empirical support was immediately suspect. Mm. And then I landed in this, uh, this thing, this somatic experiencing group where there was no research, there was no process, yet I saw things happening that my, my dogmatic kind of background could not explain. And I began immediately to really explore, like, what is really going on here? Because the explanatory paradigms of, say, energy, medicine, that didn't really jibe with my uh, empirical grounding. And so I tried to figure it out from the standpoint of some rational science that I could find acceptable and not excluding, you know, fancy metaphysics, but really insisting that this had some kind of rational, uh, logical and scientific uh, basis. So I uh, began to study that way. Great. So I'm going to ask you about the work very shortly. The last thing to say is it looks like we're Aikido cousins in that your teacher uh, your teacher's teacher was also my teacher's teacher. So um, Chiba Sensei was in the UK teaching uh, yes. my teachers before he was in the US teaching your teacher. So oh. we're, we're Aikido family. Oh, the- that is, that's very cool. <laughs> yeah, Coral Crane Shihan here in, uh, in Southern California, Solana Beach, uh, has been a long time affiliate. When I moved down here in 92, uh, I, uh, I was looking for a dojo. I, I had joined a dojo up in uh, Los Angeles and I felt like, you know, Robert Bly sometimes talks about the soft man, the soft male. Yeah. And I really felt like that, that was me, you know, that's everyone in the Bay area. Don't take it personally. <laughs> and, and yeah. And so I went and I found the roughest, toughest dojo I could find. That is the hard edge of Aikido. Like Aikido is known as like the soft, gentle art, but that that side of Aikido, that's pretty hardcore. Right, right. And yeah, and I have a dislocated shoulder to prove it, you know, <laughs> Nikyo pains <laughs> to this day. Yeah. So it was really great. Uh, and and uh, the the blend, the, the notion of blending Aiki, you know, that's that comes to the heart of organic intelligence also, because it's really that that non-resistance or finding the path of emergence that wants to be there that we believe is, you know, in harmony with universal principles. Okay, so you created your own thing. It's organic intelligent with an art registered trademark. You fucking Americans, you're always doing that. Registered trademark. Why did you make your own thing? Like what it seemed like you was coming out of some usually there's a mixture of business interests and like a dissatisfaction with existing models so what yeah. what led That's- you to kind of go okay i need to make my own approach here i can no longer continue in one of the lineages i'm trained in Yep, that's that's uh, spot on. Uh, and uh, yeah, despite those business interests, <clears throat> that hasn't worked out very well. Uh, yeah. So my immediate advice is forget uh, business interests. Uh, but really, it's it's approaching a, a process of intervention that is that is fundamentally I key. That's fundamentally <clears throat> aligning oneself with a self healing impulse from the individual's biology. So, I mean, some people say like, uh, you know, some teachers will teach you their approach. Others teach you your approach. Yeah. And that, that's, what we're, that's what we're aiming for in that difference is trying to find what is the thing that is trying to emerge that is self-organizing. And then I, I was really calling on the notion of systems therapy, systems theory, and self-organizing systems in particular, and developed a way of working that is really non-interventionist in the typical ways, and, and really has a large map for intervening in a way that's really uh, essentially harmonious with the person, personality, and, um, and, and sense of growth, or I guess these days we'd say post-traumatic growth, uh, that is at the heart of the person's uh, being. I mean, what I've seen, I've been impressed by, I was, as I said, I've been really looking forward to getting you on. And, you know, I'm not naive in this way. I've come across a few approaches to trauma. So I was like, okay, this guy's definitely done his homework. He's been around the block, you know. And if you had to put your finger on it, what was the one thing you were sort of dissatisfied with, without naming names, but in other trauma approaches that you thought, you know what? Yes, I, I know what you do is very broad based, very wide. But what was the one thing that you thought there needs to be a new approach, a new named thing because of this lack. Oh, it's the one size fits all. Like, oh, I've got the approach that you, if you use this, this will heal you. Got it. And I think that's absurd. 
uh, and you, it, the interventions, the intergate, the engagements, the attunement, it all has to be in the moment with that person right, right. now. And everything else is just a recipe. Okay, now I'm going to try to do something to you that makes your system conform to my expectation. I think that's uh, that's kind of an abomination to the human spirit. It seems to me in the trauma world. So when I first like looking at trauma, it happened to me. My one of my keto teachers in the states, Paul Linden, happened to be a trauma teacher. So I was well ahead of the curve before it before it was popular. You know, I was into the band before they were big. You know. And, yeah. um, and then trauma became well-known. Peter Levine, David Baselli, other people, you know, came forward. And I was like, great, this is really good news. And it became a widespread thing. And now there's all these trauma approaches that are sort of fighting amongst themselves a bit. And often it's very well-meaning. It's people that have a very good, maybe they, you know, go to a somatic experiencing or a TRE practitioner or, you know, a Hakomi practitioner. And they have a really good experience. So they then say, right, this is the one way to deal with trauma everyone should shake or everyone should do tapping or everyone should do whatever because it's worked for them. And it's kind of, I think most of the time, well-meaning sometimes the cynic in me says there's a business interest here for saying this is the only way to do it. Sure. And it seems like we need another, I, I worry actually the sort of copyright model of business interest is going to get in the way of what needs to emerge now in the trauma field which is a sort of integration between all these different approaches, which are all copyrighted and all defended in terms of who's allowed to teach them and who's allowed to say they're a SE practitioner or a TRE practitioner. So do you know what I mean? Like in terms of where we're at now in the trauma field, I think it needs something that the structures we currently have might actually be getting in the way of. Uh, I sure do. I, uh, I agree. And it's one of the, the great things actually about say your podcast or other yeah internet programs it's this great democratizing mm -hmm. you know you can't you can't keep ideas locked away anymore you know you can't right. you, and you can't copyright the nervous system and so there is just you know a, a broad base of sharing that's happening a lot of interactions among people that are happening and a lot of sharing of information i think that's really good for the field yeah okay let's take a step back then so listeners are coming from really broad backgrounds if someone said to you, like not a therapist, but maybe a yoga teacher or martial arts teacher, we have a, a lot of these guys listen to the podcast. If they said, hey, I've heard that trauma is really important. What is trauma, Steve? Where would you begin with that? Yeah, so um, and that gets back a little bit to the level of dissatisfaction because, yeah. uh, you know, like uh, there are people that say the way to, to heal trauma is through sensation, sensation awareness, or the way through trauma is by being coming aware of your thought processes or the yeah. way through trauma is by becoming aware of emotions. But I'm coming at this from the standpoint of the biology. And I think the biology doesn't really care much about trauma. Uh, biology has a whole other set of agendas and, uh, and imperatives. And so uh, the signals from, from the biology are going to be largely uh, those that s reinforce the status quo. And as the, <clears throat> the biology has the agenda, I think, just to stay stable because uh, change could mean disintegration. Yep. could mean system compromising. Basic homeostatic mechanism, right? Right. right. And so uh, if you're going to then try to have change that everybody promises, you have to take into account that stabilization first. Uh, and so uh, from, from that point of stabilization, then you can move toward the self signaling, like the biology itself is also signaling and sending organizing signals to us. And we're just missing those because we're focused on trauma. So the first thing I would say about trauma is let go of the idea of trauma and start looking for uh, stability, start looking for resource uh, and start looking for uh, grounding in this material reality, namely connecting to the environment through the senses. Start not by introspection or, uh -huh. or sensation. Start by checking in with, with where things are at right here, right now in your environment. So again, even simpler, like I want to come back to this, this is some good stuff. Here. What, what is trauma? So what is it? Is, is it? Trauma is biological desynchrony. Say what trauma, that means. Trauma is the way that our system stops working cooperatively with itself. You know, your breath and your heart rate are supposed to be linked together and they're supposed mm -hmm. to have this fluid mm -hmm. relationship with each other, respiratory sinus, arrhythmia. But, uh, but oftentimes, those signals uh, systems disintegrate 
And so the heart rate will become their, an arrhythmia, uh, right? Instead of the muscles being able to relax when they need to, they're tense. All of that means that systems aren't feeding back into each other. And the, that, that's, uh, the, our, our biorhythms basically are, are upset. So that's great. I'm really enjoying this. And we're moving quite quick here. So maybe this is for people that have got, a, you know, there's other podcasts we've got where we do trauma basics. So why don't we keep moving quick and say a couple of things stood out for me when I did a bit of research on you before this. I listened to a few other podcasts and YouTube things. One was this idea that if we're focusing on trauma, we're, we're focusing on this bias of looking for trauma and then yes. we'll find it, right? This negativity bias, this um, uh, framing of things where we're priming ourselves to see things in a certain way. And the second thing I liked about what I heard from you, other talks was you said, there's an inv- we're coming out of a even new environment, which now is impoverished. And Charles Eisenstein, we had on talks about this, that we're now not in community. We're not singing and dancing and doing all the things that our tribal ancestors would have done. So we're, we're, we're sort of biologically dysregulated because we're in this weird fucking environment that just we're just not designed for. So yeah. maybe, have I summarized those two things? Oh, for sure. For sure. And, uh, and so, yeah, we are, we're, I, we're having what I call a Nemo moment, you know, from finding Nemo. We're, we're in the aquarium we're, and we, we, oh, everything's good. Everything's working well. It's temperature controlled. We got light and stuff. But we have this, this nagging feeling like, oh, maybe I belong someplace else. Mm. And we do. We don't have any of the existing supports that our biology expects from, uh, from nature and from our social environment. We're basically a tribe of people now looking for our tribe. And we're, we're lost. Do you think, you know, all this stuff on traumas is a very individualistic solution to the fact that we're, you know, I've just, dri- just been driven an Uber by some guy whose name I didn't even know. Do you know what I mean? He's from another tribal group. He might speak another language. I don't know him. I'm in a car, which is a totally weird, you know, it's not like walking through the woods. I just, you know, I tell you what, if I walk through the woods, I feel better without any fucking therapist needed. Immediately. Right. So I'm going, okay, I'm not in the physical or cultural or social environment that I was designed, but you know, by evolution for, I mean, has trauma therapy got any hope in this weird context we find ourselves in? Right. N- not unless we really take into account the way that the biology wants to reorganize. And that's really the key. Like we can go for a walk in nature and that creates a state that feels better. Yeah. But better state is only good as long as you're working to maintain that state. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, really then from that point of stabilization or from a better state, how are we going to find what really grows the biology's capacity or bandwidth in uh, this totally abnormal environment? So, again, the million-dollar question, what works, right? Because we can learn all the tricks. You know, they do, you go, right, I've got up, I've got to do my meditation, I've got to get better at my interoception, I've done the embodiment stuff, so I'm, I'm building that muscle, and that sort of helps me reset a little bit from this mental you know, environment that I find every day I have to keep doing that. I have to keep doing my shaking or my, you know, mindfulness or my centering. And these are all great. And I love teaching these things to people because it can be a hell of a good thing to stable. It helps someone stabilize. And, you know, I'd much rather I had meditation than I didn't. I'd much rather I had centering than I didn't. But sometimes it can feel like I'm really going against the grain here. I'm really swimming against the tide. Um, You know, is that all we've, is that all we're able to do is just sort of piss in the wind or is, or is there a, a better way? Right. Is there a fundamental system shift that's possible? We can do temporary shifts, you know, as long as we're doing our belly breathing and our yoga asanas and our, uh, you know, yeah. uh, you know uh, all of our mantras and relaxation. You know, all of those are nice, effective, useful, as you say. And there's just a limit. And everybody reaches that limit. What's the difference? What is the difference, as Bateson would say? What's the difference that makes a difference? And, and for me, uh, what I was looking at was in uh, the complexity science world, that these, the, there's a pretty distinct three-phase model that says, how does a system become self-organizing? And that's really the key. What is it that changes from me doing this, an egocentric, good works uh, doing uh, process, well-informed, what is it that makes that turn into a self-sustaining process that is a biologically 
catalyze process. And that's what we're trying to do in, in OI is see the, these phases and how you reliably shift from, say, chaos, a system that is self-disorganizing, into then phase two, a system that is becoming more stable, and then into phase three in which the system itself is doing its qualitative uh, growth patterns. And that's, that's really the, the trick, is to see when a system can grow its bandwidth, when it can grow its information processing ability, its problem-solving ability, and so on. So it's a bit abstract for me. Let's talk it through. Someone comes to you, they say, I don't know, I was in a car crash, and you know, maybe I've... Uh, uh, you had not the best childhood, not massive abuse, but you know, some difficult things in my childhood. And maybe I had a sexual assault 10 years back and I'm, I'm a bit wired, you know, maybe they're suffering sort of what we might call hyper arousal symptoms. They're mm -hmm. wired. They're not sleeping well. They're antagonizing their husband in their relationship a little bit. You know, they're, that is coming out relationally. Their boundaries are a bit over or under defended. So we're talking sort of, you know, not exactly fully middle-class trauma, but, you know, someone that's got a sort of solid case of trauma, it's a bit developmental, it's a bit, it's a bit shock trauma. They come to you and they say, Steve, what the hell did you, I just read your, you know, I just listened to the first half of the podcast you did with Mark, I read your book, but what do we actually do now? What do we, what do we get on with? Yeah. So I'm, I'm assessing right away from the moment the person comes in, yeah. I'm assessing that, that thing. I, what I'm suggesting to the trauma field that instead of focusing on trauma, Focus on information processing or intensity processing. How well does a system connect to the environment through the senses? How well mapped into the environment is it? And how does it handle uh, challenge in, in relationship? How does it handle intensity? And I'm tracking toward on that a notion of threshold, that everybody has a certain threshold at which their system begins to experience too much challenge. And, uh, and that, that uh, sort of um, uh, generic uh, upper middle class uh, trauma person may be a person whose system is ready to disorganize and has really limited bandwidth or really limited uh, affect regulation, or they may have really decent uh, affect regulation. But I would have to see that person to see how that system is operating. What, what does it do with a deeper spontaneous breath? What does it do when I go, oh yeah, you know, that, that sounds really, really rough. You know, what have you tried to do before? And I'm looking at how that system responds in the relationship to go, how organized is it? You know, what, does the person space out? Does the person uh, begin to become focused? So they say, oh no, no, don't talk about that. I've got, my, I've got the thing I need to talk about here. Right? How much flexibility, fluidity, adaptability does that system have? And then that tells me how I'm going to uh, proceed. And yeah, it seems in researching you, I mostly saw some of your sort of general intros and theory. It seems like it's pretty broad based in terms of interventions. Did I, did I get the right, the right idea there? Well, again, the, the interventions to me have to be based in one of these major phases. Is this system like a phase one system? Is it, is it sort of battling chaos? And if so, that's, right. the, er, that's the early developmental process. Uh, attunement, really close and tight attunement is really key. You're, you, you have a person who is in one of three systems, and you have to attune to that person based on one of those three systems. Uh, so it is broad-based, and it's fairly complex because it's not this one-size-fits-all. You've got you've to take into account the major ways that our biology organizes and disorganizes. Can you give us sort of maybe a case study or a sense of some of the things that you, you, you know, how do you work with people who are a bit stuck in this fight or flight? Like what, what's like, give us a few examples. Yeah. I want to just kind of flesh this out. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the direction on that. Um, it is, uh, it is a bit abstract really overall. Um, the main thing that I would say is, um, our main assessment on with a person would be how well they're able to connect to the environment through the senses. How well is that biology responding? So when the person, I say, I might say to the person, oh yeah, and when you say that, how are things looking in the room to you? Yeah. And then I'm watching it, as they look, and I, I see <laughs> a uh, a tarot card that's been pulled and is over there. And as I look at that, 
I, you know, my eyes brighten a little bit. There's emotion that happens, but all of that is uh, for a, a client is going to tell me how much affect regulation is there, how much yeah. affective yeah. range is there, how much connection to the environment, or do they just go into thinking, oh yeah, I think this is a really nice room, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Right? dissociation. So, so that's the first thing. How, how well is the person oriented? How can they connect to the environment? And the second is the biology, the body is producing, the system is producing self-supportive behaviors, thoughts, yeah. emotions all the time that we are missing because of that negativity bias and the what's wrong and the trauma mm -hmm. and so on. So the other thing that I would be interested in is hearing the other side of their experience. That is, yeah, we got, we got trauma. And then I'm going to be asking questions like, oh, man, that is, that is horrific. And, yeah, and yeah. as a trauma therapist, I've seen it all from yeah. you know, concentration camp survivors, ritual abuse. Yeah. And, and yet those questions can come around like, wow, that is, that is horrific. How in the world did you ever make it through that? Right. I, right. I'm, I'm looking for the avenues of self-organization and more positive affect because they're always there. They're just underappreciated. It's interesting that trauma, you know, it's affecting thinking. Some people work with thinking. It's affecting biology. You know, I was coaching someone just yesterday and they came in. I run pretty fast, but, you know, this person came in and they they were wired. Like they were, they could barely sit still. And I was like, okay, we just need to discharge some of this before we can even begin to have a conversation. You know, this is, a, they, they were, you know, it's very difficult for them to even think straight. Um, as you say, for some people, it's more the emotional. They're in emotional overwhelm and they need to just stabilize. For other people, they're emotionally just, I've got a lot of Russian clients who are just, you know, everything's near, you know, just cut off from their emotion. Quick break to tell you about our program. So as well as the podcast, we have various kinds of online training. So we have the Embodied Yoga Principles online training, as well as in-person training. Embodied Yoga Principles for yogis who want to get yoga off the mat, specialize in the psychology of yoga, um, unique postures. It's a five-day training. We have one in Brighton, one in Berlin, and um, one in Austin, Texas. So if you go to Embodied Yoga Principles, you can find them. Also, the online version of the training for people who can't make those dates. Um, yeah, excellent courses. The Embodied Yoga Principles training for the yogis. Um, for the coaches and facilitators, we have the Embodied Facilitator course. This is our flagship course. We offer it in Moscow, also in the UK. A nine-month adventure real deep dive into embodiment you know it's the biggest embodiment program i do uh, it could be like movement people who want to work in business more we have um, people like dancers and uh, martial arts teachers come to learn more about um, working in mainstream settings but also for coaches and trainers who want something really well structured and want to work on themselves want to learn practical tools um yeah learn how to work with the body in facilitation if you can't make EFC, and you know, that's it is a big ask, there's an online uh, course we run called the Foundations of Embodiment Certification. So if you go to Embodied Facilitator, you'll find the in person and then dash FEC, F E C, F for Freddie, E C for Charlie, F E C, you'll come up with the Foundations of Embodiment Certification and also do one day events all around the world. So I'm going to just about to do a tour to Slovenia, Berlin, Copenhagen. Hagen, Brussels, Amsterdam, um, and Brighton. The Brighton one is £10, which is like 15 bucks. So if you're coming from abroad, that could make that affordable. The Brighton one's always like a really big, fun one. So that's coming up. Again, go to the Embodied Facilitator course to see all of these events. And we have a little online evening as well. If people just want to taste her again, that's £10. Uh, that's a three hour thing coming up as well. EmbodiedFacilitator.com, EmbodiedFacilitator.com, and you'll find and all those events or embodied yoga principles for the yoga ones. Okay, so that's the stuff uh, that I sell. Oh, and the book, the embodiment book. If you want to get my book and learn about embodiment through reading, you can also get the embodiment book available at Amazon and no good bookstores. So um, yeah, there we go. Excuse the interruption and back to the episode. And it's like they need to actually feel a bit. You need to kind of get them feeling a little bit. But it's interesting what you said to me earlier that, the the interior reception isn't the place to go so you know i'm an embodiment guy so i'm like okay cool there's a challenge to that kind of work let's hear about that like feeling is not the place to go because a lot of modalities would say you know what it's all about fully experiencing the emotion fully experiencing right. the body 
you know, where the trauma numbs people. So you get back in touch with the body to tell me why that's not, not the way forward. Yeah, because it, and it goes right back to the system that wants to reorganize itself. It's going to be sending signals through all of those channels, most of which just say, stay the same, stay screwed up because it's better than screwing up even more. Uh, so uh, most, of this, most of the signals from your images, your sensation, cognitions, emotion, all of those will be sending signals of what's wrong and we're addicted to that. And there are always signals coming from any of those channels that are disproportionately supportive and organizing. And the, the cool thing is, one is that it's always coming. So uh, I have to watch a person, I have to sit with a person and see, ah, is the supportive signal, is it coming from through their images? Is it coming through sensation? Is it coming through the body experience? Is it coming through cognition or emotion? And then I focus on that. I'm focusing on a system that is bringing itself good news of support, but I don't know where it's going to come in through emotion, sensation, image, or uh, or cognition, it, it can come through any of those. So that's, that's why it's not a one size fits all process. The, the thing that is true is that always the system, as long as it, there is breath, there is support coming. And my, my job is to train people to see where that's coming through and then reiterate that in their system so that it does what it's actually there for. Right, right now there, Mark, right now there is this happening. Yeah. If I were to actually feel this in sensation, uh, maybe me, me so twisting just my... Just because audio, you're, you've uh, copied me. I'm twirling a pen while listening to you, and Steve's copied that. So I'm just, I'm just right. making the uh, radio right. television. Right, right. So if I were to actually feel this, unquote, in air quotes, unconscious habit, yeah. Yeah. if I were to make this conscious, I would have a different feedback into my system. Uh -huh. Just like that. Just like that. Okay, so for me, like I'm doing this, and it's it's almost some sense of sort of rolling something forwards as I move this pen. There's a and, a kind of felt of sense of advancing somehow. You know, okay, I'm learning something here. We're getting like actually, it's like a positive thing for me. It's like we're getting somewhere. My and system's the, going. Okay, the, I'm learning about trauma. I'm getting somewhere right? further than I were before, was before. And this rhythm, like the rhythm of the head nodding forward. Yeah. yeah. And that's all signals straight from your biology saying, hey, I love Mark today. Check this shit out. Uh -huh. oh, that's nice. So you just, you, you're picking the things that are going on, which are positive, which are healing, and reinforcing those, bringing those into awareness. It's, it's, it, right. It reminds right. me of and two it, things. Coaching is very much like this. That it's this humanistic framework. It's, it's almost like you brought a humanistic perspective into the somatic work and a bit of NLP. Uh, for sure. And it's, and it is coming not only, and I'm trained in all of those areas. So I'm trained in tracking cognition. I'm trained and got another one going here. Uh, I can't see it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm going to slide some in nonetheless. It's good for us. Um, uh, and it's come through cognition. It'll come through emotion. It'll come through image. And my job is just to be ready and nimble enough to see when it comes reflect it back in a way that it can be received by the person. So what was it? So about I'm twirling this pen, right? And as soon as you said, it, I did actually have a sense that it was something positive. There's, it reminded me of like a wheel going round and moving forwards was the sort of association for me. And it was some sense of like, Oh great. I'm enjoying this podcast because I'm getting somewhere. I'm learning something. We're moving the field forward in some way. These are all the associations that were just under the conscious awareness when I'm twirling yes. this pen around like an axle on a car, you know? And um, what was it about that action as opposed to, I don't know, I'd scratch my neck or something. What was it that made you pick that out as something that, cause it just looked like a guy with a pen, right? I mean, you know, we all simple action. What made you pick that out? Uh, it takes some training. It takes some practice to see those that those um, movements, movements of thought, movements of the body, movements of emotion, movements of image that are disproportionately signaling you <laughs> and me uh, to enjoy themselves more. And and more than just like giving me a state that is unique to your biological moment and your creation from this deep impulse of self-organization that were we not only to take it in cognitively you gave you gave like the cognitive frame but also then to feel it in the channel it comes yeah, through yeah, that yeah. would be sensation 
No, I was that, also aware there's a somatics to it, like a, a rhythmic moving yeah. forward with the nodding, almost like a car yeah. machine moving forward. Yeah. And, and there's that an emotional was, quality of sort of like satisfaction and like, okay, yeah. 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 It's yeah. my time perception is influenced by it. Like, it's like, it's like oh, I'm not, yeah. sometimes I'm on a podcast and I'm kind of like, okay, okay, great, get on with it. You know, I'm sort of treading water <laughs> a little bit. Whereas this right. is sort of a different emotional feel to it. This. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and if we and and that comes all the time, all the all the time, every day, ongoingly. And if we were to care enough to pay attention and to receive that signal, it would change our uh, biology completely. So that's that, a that nice is, frame to look at the world, Steve. Right? Are you like going in Starbucks and seeing all the sort of you know the guys making the coffee, and you're seeing like all the positive stuff that's trying to get out of his system? I mean, it must be kind of a a nice frame to be looking at the world with, you know? It's super fun. And, yeah. and uh, no, you know, you, you have to pay me to actually uh, see these things. And, um, and, but yes, I, you know, it's fun because as a, as a therapist, as a coach, I am enjoying this process back and forth. And, and the, the more your system grows, there is, I think the Buddhists call it uh, mudita, right? There is sympathetic yeah, right. enjoyment. And, and that's a lot better for, I'm going to interrupt, that's a lot better for burnout than if I'm constantly just focusing on someone's pain and, oh, that must be awful, and, oh, empathy, yeah, great. But it's a hell of a lot nicer thing and a hell of a lot more resilient thing to focus on as a therapist, I imagine, oh, than yeah. simply everything that's wrong. Because, you're yes, you're, I mean, you're empathizing, I'm sure you're acknowledging the hurt, things that have happened, you're not pushing that away. It doesn't sound right. like positive thinking, you know. No, it, no, there's, no, there's a degree of sort of like, wow, you're mostly focusing on the resourcing, which is, is also better for you because there's so much burnout amongst trauma people. Totally, totally. And uh, it, it, you're right. Yeah, as I see these things, I can't help but enjoy and co-enjoy co the experience with you. And I've got my own going on that I'm paying attention to. But it's this orientation toward that which is self-organizing. So again, the... The difference between a state that just feels good, okay, I feel good in the moment, and one that, and the signals that are actually growing our bandwidth of information processing, growing our organizational capacity, that's, these are two different things. And so what I'm looking for and reflecting back on a good day are those things that are going to have a disproportionately organizing effect on your biology. This is great. This is great. I already want you back on the show. So this is going to be part one. If you're up for doing part two, we've still got a bit of time. But okay, okay. so um, let me kind of hit this from another couple of angles then. Yeah. So what else is good out there? Like, do you rate NAM? I mean, what is it out there that you go, someone put NAM and you towards me as sophisticated sort of next level approaches. Is there anything else out there that you go, this is something I rate again, because I want to get over that just you know, promoting your own thing. We're going to, you know, you want to share your website at the end, obviously, but like what right. else is out there that's good? Yeah. Um, uh, I like a lot of the positive psychology uh, process. Uh, we have a lot of conversations with people that are in meditation. Uh, we're spending a lot of time with activists also these days, you know, the, uh, so much of the reason that we're doing what we're doing is because the, the, the globe is on a cusp of, you know, annihilation uh, over a short term. So, you know, this risk of burnout is, is certainly for therapists, but is also for activists, people that are trying to make, make the planet a better place. So uh, any, anything in those directions, you know, I'm really keen yeah. to provide those supports and support for people that are providing supports. I'm, I'm down with anybody who is a caring homo sapien and, uh, really uh, creating a more inclusive and uh, this is going to sound really corny, inclusive and just place for us to live. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, you, I trained activists quite a lot and I've moved away from it. Actually. I hear activists now. I just hear arrogance and psychological screwed upness and um, more harm than good. So I'm not with you on the activism front. I've, I've just, I've, as soon as I hear yeah. that now, I just go, Oh yeah. God, I don't want to be anywhere near it. Because it's just uh, so toxic. Nine well, times out of ten, there's one out of ten that that doesn't apply to. But that's that's maybe just different personal experience. Yep. Well, the, uh, I think you've just uh, tapped into a growth industry, then, haven't you? A growth industry, right? Okay, I see. Yeah, there's plenty of work to be done there. I, I like that. Right? Well, okay, let me hear oh, another. One. Go on. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Top misunderstandings about trauma because everyone's a trauma expert now. 
five years ago, maybe 10 years ago in the Bay Area, a bit slower, it was like no one knew what trauma was. So you could just say, hey, you know, trauma's this, it's that, these are treatments. But now everyone's a trauma expert. So I'm hearing sort of trauma myths and in the same way as there's yoga myths, you know, what are the sort of top things you wish you could just kind of bits of bullshit you could just correct? What do, what do you hear as the main ones? Well, you know, you're talking to the end of trauma person here. So uh, I would say uh, to under, <laughs> it's, it's going to end up being self-promotion. Uh, I think... Uh, you can't help it. You can't help it. Go on. Go on. Go on, Go on Steve. I'll give you, I'll give you a uh, free card for this. All past All right. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, uh, I think we should uh, really think seriously about the biology and how the physiology really works. And, and use, apply a science that's well-established, namely complexity science, and stop using linear models and simplistic models uh, to try to heal trauma. Everything will work sometimes. And uh, so, yeah, I think maybe the biggest thing is um, to uh, take into account uh, the people that you work with that you don't hear back from. There is Dude, so much. That is really good. I want to just, I want to slow this right down because this applies to people that don't come back to your yoga class, people that do a week of Aikido, then leave because everyone's looking at a fucking weird sample, which is the people that kept coming to them. Right. Exactly. And that's, that just is self-reinforcing. And there are so many people I'm sure you work with as well. And I do too, who've <clears throat> worked in all the fields that you've named so far and just said, I was so screwed up by working in that model or with that person, you know, and, and it, it applies, I'm sure in my own, but we've got to look at that. Like we've got to look at harm reduction, I think. And the chief harm I believe is going into the trauma too much, ex- working explicit trauma content. Uh, in, in other words, this is a, a full challenge to the entirety of the empirically supported exposure protocols. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Any other sort of ones that you hear and just kind of, you've got to sort of face palming, eye rolling point with things that you kind of, kind of repeatedly hear? Well, you know, no, I mean, that's, that's really it. I think the, the people that are spending too much time, if you're, if you're talking about trauma, you're not taking into account uh, the, the biology. There are, there are times that you have to join with a person. Like you said, attunement is really key. But there are really good models for how to work with people with complex situations without traumatizing them and, and avoiding over-traumatization through tracking their sensations, through their emotional overload. Just there is way too much intensity uh, going on and, and hitting that sweet spot between uh, too little intensity and too much intensity, I think, is where it's at. I have a bit of a wild card here. Like I'm interested in things that don't look like trauma treatments, but are. So I, at the moment I'm listening to a lot of history. There's a great history podcast called hardcore history. And in order, you know, a lot of it's about war and, you know, this one about the Romans and uh, the gladiators and the Japanese world war two history. And there's a way in which it feels like uh, a healing process to sort of you know, make meaning of these terrible things that have happened in the past that may have influenced my family or just are in there in the zeitgeist somewhere, you know, the Western civilization is built on the Romans or another one. I wrote a book and in the, in my turn to self promote and in the, in the, the writing of the book ended up being a healing process yeah. or for some people, it's just getting a hobby. Like how many people have you seen come to Aikido? They've not done any trauma work, but on some level it's healed them and they were just intuitively drawn to Aikido. But we yeah. also see in Aikido and, you know, maybe people that watch too much YouTube about war, you know, also see the repetition compulsion and the, oh, I feel at home watching Stalingrad movies because my system feels like it's in a war, you know? Right. So it's like there's this sort of self-healing art that can lead to things that aren't looking like therapy, being yeah. the best therapy. Do you know what I mean? Like it's sort of, I'm sort of like thinking that. out loud here a little bit. So yeah, for sure. You know, the, the thing that I think about is this, is this phrase, like no matter uh, what the, the question, the answer is community. And, 
and you know like this sense of participation the sense of belonging you know we're i think we're so alienated uh we're so absent our tribe <clears throat> i think things like uh, what you're describing uh, help people and so much because it's a sense of participation that breaks through some of the isolation and alienation and uh, brings connection and community. I think that's, that's one aspect to it. I think that's, that's really good. Yeah. I think that's really valuable and, mm. and enjoyable. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have a dojo, it has the ritual, it has the community, it has the simple hierarchy, you know, kind of, it's saying things all together. It's not quite song, but you know, even everyone's saying on a gashi by ass at the beginning, there's a sort of call and response element. It's got a lot of sort of things going on, hasn't it? That are kind of tribal sure in a funny way. Uh, sure does. And, and that that's home for us, you know, and that's, that's stabilization. I can feel safe. I can feel okay. And I think Porges has done a nice job saying you, you got to start with that stabilization. You got to start yeah. with stability. And that, that ventral vagal component, that social engagement, that engagement oh. process. I think you, really you rate Stephen Porges, his model of the kind of uh, ventral vagal and all this, this sort of thing. Polyvagal theory. Yeah. 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 We're really, we find that maps really well with our protocols. Great. Great. Yeah. Okay. We seem to be moving to sort of towards a wrap up here. We've in the last 10 minutes. Um, there's a natural flow to these podcasts. I like to kind of feel, um, yeah. You know, any other particularly colorful, juicy novel areas that we haven't covered or something a bit different from your work that you think, oh, that might be interesting to listeners to put that out there? Well, I, you know, uh, I have been uh, enjoying watching your progression and the, the move that's been happening. And, and while doesn't it have something to do with love? With, no. with me or the podcast or? <laughs> right i mean just the whole thing for sure right like like the 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 way that we grow and then grow into love relationships you know mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the notion also of of our being in tune with our biological unfolding you know and and so you know you think of you think of mating you think of sort of the sublimation even of mating into like creative endeavor. So I think creativity uh, maybe is another topic that I hear that in the right. reflection that you're looking at when you're looking at the history of Rome and the Colosseum. We were just there, you know, a couple of weeks ago. It's crazy, right? I mean, human history and the way that humans have enslaved each other and done really gnarly, you know, horrific things with each other I, you know uh, so uh, if we are to evolve uh, we're going to need a certain amount of creativity and uh, and something about that that creative movement that creative impulse i think is essential you know I've, a really interesting question i've been playing with lately and i think as instinctively i don't want to keep focusing on trauma my own fucking trauma or anyone else's is what's the opposite of trauma now, it's, just, it's a poetic question. It's not a literal question. Right. And things I came up with were, you know, community, connection, play, creativity would be one, right? The trauma closes us down. It makes us very like, you have to do the thing you've always done, as opposed to like looking for new solutions and being able to sort of dance and play. You know, love obviously would be another one. You know, what, right. what, let's jam on that a little bit. Just like if I said to you, what's the opposite of trauma? what would be like a couple of creative responses? I'm not going to hold you to any of them. No, 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 no. But play, you know, is really what it, that's, that's right in the, that's right in the pocket, you know, and play would be, you know, from a, say a, a nervous system standpoint and a poor just informed standpoint would be ventral vagal plus sympathetic arousal, you know, that's social, but it's energized. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the other that would be complementary would be easeful relaxation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, and so there's the play that's the more energized and then there is the rest. The I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Nice. Nice. You know, I realized recently just how off the play side I'm pretty good at these days, the, just how little I go into that fully rest digest and it's December, it's winter. And I'm like, you know what? It's when I kind of, I'm, I'm wrapping up my work for the year. I'm ending my days earlier. You know, we're on a seven o'clock finish here, which is actually pretty early for me. And, and you know, I'm going to take a few weeks out. It's going into myself, my wife in our house, you know, really to make space for that. And I'm lucky I've got a job where I can do that as opposed to some, someone that's got to go to an office and right. turn the lights on and they've got to do their nine till six, whatever, you know, yeah. it seems like that is a sickness of the modern world. We're not, honoring that we need to rest and digest 
Uh, yeah, indeed. And I, I think that we stay busy. <laughs> I think was it, it was a Roger Moore flick in which uh, he asked Marilyn Manson, yeah. uh, like, what is it? And, and Manson had this really, uh, I thought, erudite critique of the He's current... He's pretty story. deep. Manson's not stupid. Right? Right? Someone asked him, what would you tell the Columbine killers? And he says, I wouldn't tell them anything. I'd listen. And I thought, oh, that's fucking yeah. good answer. Oh you know, yeah, right. So what did he say this time? What was his? And, and this, and this time he said they they keep us anxious so that we keep on buying. Yeah, yeah. and 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 there's something about that. Like if I keep busy, I yeah. can stay on top. And and underlying that from a nervous system standpoint, I think is the freeze system, is that dorsal vagal system that is that is deadening and it is hopelessness, helplessness. It's a dead like state. And if you slow down too much, then you end up just sinking into that. Yeah. And that yeah. is so, uh, that, those are the numbing qualities, you know, in terms of the PTSD um, uh, identifiers. That's the, the psychological numbing aspects. That's what really drives people to an edge. And we stay busy because that sympathetic arousal keeps us skimming along the surface like skiers. Because if we slowed down on that lake, we just sink down. Right. I find out so many times we do courses or I go on meditation retreats myself. And the first day or two, I'm like, right, course, great, learn some stuff. And then there's that like day two or three, assuming you've made a good container and people feel safe and held. And they, you know, they're getting their, they've got their gluten free bullshit, whatever, you know, everyone's happy. And then it's like, then everyone just exhausted and is sleeping 10 hours a day because they're, yeah. they're, they're coming yeah. down from that fight or flight. But as you say, the other one is to get stuck in the numbing, right? So it's like, yes. Something yeah. about satisfaction as well. Like, like I kind of just my book sold pretty well. We just launched the book, sold pretty well. My wife's fucking great. I got money in the bank. I'm in a warm house for the winter. You know, it's sort of like take some time out. But there's all because there's always something I could be doing, and I think so many listeners are self-employed. There's, yeah. an, there's always another thing you could be doing, Steve, to promote your organic intelligence model. Another podcast to be going on. Another guest to be getting on. You know what I mean? And there's something, there's almost like this crazy act of defiance in the modern world to just say, yeah, yeah I'm going to have a weekend or yeah, I'm going to turn my phone off for a week. You right. know what I mean? Not just a retreat because right. that can be another piece of work, but. Sure. You know, we have a, we have, we have refrigerator magnets that say the job is enjoyment. Uh -huh. And this whole battle that we're doing with the negativity bias, and the what's wrong attention is that we, we stay stimulated and overstimulated yeah, yeah, yeah. by an addictive process. And, uh, and to really focus on enjoyment takes so much practice because our systems keep us jumping. And it's, it's through no fault of our own. And this is just conditioning process. You know, I, I've been saying that uh, we, we have sacrificed or we have substituted for genuine human pleasure the satisfaction of getting things done. Wow. Nice. That is very nice. Very nice. Oh, I feel like we're hitting on some deep topics here. We're kind of uh, getting to uh, uh, the the real the, the the real essence. See, this is the thing. When you really look at trauma work, you think it's about healing a guy who's come out of a war or a woman that's been abused, and then you realize you're actually challenging the fundamental basis of our entire modern world. <laughs> like yeah. trauma yeah. gets real political once you're in it for a while, and you go absolutely yes. Yes, and you know, there's a nice book uh, called Pleasure Activism now, you know? Have you seen that? Pleasure Activism? No, but I, I've been really enjoying uh, studying the last two days with an Italian Feldenkrais teacher, and she's just making the whole thing, she's bringing this Italian pleasure to it. Pleasure Activism, oh. it's full of mating animals. The Politics of Feeling right. Good by, who's the author? Just so listeners can. Adrian, Adrian Marie Brown. Okay. And, and really, it's so true that this notion of orienting toward pleasure, you know, the uh, Pulitzer Prize winning author E.O. Wilson looked at us and, and on human nature, he looked at us and said, we're made for pleasure. Right. He looked at our nerves, our sensory organs. He said, we're made for pleasure. And that's, that's the channel of our, our forward movement in evolution, right? That's, that's natural selection. It's pleasure. So that orientation toward pleasure, healthy, non-addictive, non-intoxicant related pleasure, that's our jam. Say know, that again, because you, you know, like I'm a prone to addiction and there's other kinds of pleasure that aren't so healthy. So, so what defines a sort of healthy 
uh, you know, healthy pleasure as opposed to something which is just, you know, because I see a lot of people having a lot of excitement in their pleasure or using pleasure as a way to numb. And it's a little bit of a different thing, isn't it? Yeah, we're talking about some kind of simple human pleasure, right? You know, and we described it like, oh, what if I take those two weeks and I, I'm sitting by the fire with a loved one? What if, what if it's simple human pleasure? Something like that, because the intensity pleasures, those excitements, that's just going to rev the system more. Yes, but yes, you yes. can cultivate the ability to savor a, a, a huge diversity of of pleasures. We're in we're in much better shape. You know, we're we're made to have biodiversity. We're made to crave a diversity of foods. You know, so yeah. Uh, to get the diversities of pleasure, become I, I coach people to become pleasure experts. But that's really nice. That's really nice. You know, interestingly, I've, I've, I've been sober for 13 years. And I've heard quite a lot of people get sober over the years. And reliably, after a few months of being sober, they all start saying, oh, I started enjoying the simple things again. I started enjoying that little cappuccino. I started enjoying the sun coming. I started enjoying my kid's smile. That's, like, that's a reliable thing that people say when they get yeah. sober again, when the, right. when the sort of the need for the super stimuli. Yes. That, crack the porn the you know whatever yeah the, the super excitement comes down people go i really enjoy these little things and, mm -hmm. yeah. and most of what my wife and i enjoy doing is just sort of hanging out and having a cup of tea together and having a hug and it's just the pleasure in life becomes very strong but from quite little things yes L listen that is a nice place to wrap up um where do people find out more about you i heard a podcast from you that was pretty good um that's the end of, the end of trauma podcast. right Yep, the End of Trauma podcast, Organic Intelligence, uh, organicintelligence.org. That's our jam. Great. And any other resources you're recommending on trauma or other yep. things you've been on that yep. you would recommend? Yep, Simple Human Pleasure and uh, Connection and, uh, and buying Mark's book. <laughs> well, thanks for the mutual plug. So I have really enjoyed this. I'm going to invite you to the Embodiment Conference, definitely, and to come back on the show. I'm going to go absorb a bunch of stuff over the next few months. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, we've done a lot of podcasts. There's a podcast, for example, called um, Introduction to Trauma, uh, Beginner's Guide to Trauma. Sorry, it's called People Can Look Up. So if people okay. felt a bit out of their depth listening to this one, listen to Beginner's Guide to Trauma. Listen to some of the earlier ones on trauma from um, Betsy, from Irene Lyons, from David Baselli. And I think maybe if you're up for it, we do another one and we just sort of do a bit more advanced or one where we assume people know some of the basics and get going a bit more at the deep end if, if that sounds good to do uh, i'd so enjoy that and uh and so yeah let's do our job let's uh, let's enjoy another conversation <laughs> i think we we embodied that one cheers steve brilliant. thank you so much for your time today pleasure yeah completely brilliant thanks so much some ways to uh, get more to give back and to get more involved now so um the biggest request i have would be to share the podcast with your friends people that you think would really enjoy it um email it to them put it on your social media tell them about it old school um yeah really appreciate that equally if you want to support us financially you can go to patreon that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash embodiment podcast and give us a dollar an episode and i'd say they're well worth a dollar so um that's less than a pound if you're in UK-ish. So yeah, please go there. Um, on the embodyfacilitator.com website is where this is hosted. If you're most people, I think, listen to for iTunes. Um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodyfacilitator.com, you can see the actual you know links to the sites comments on there um, the Facebook group tends to be where people discuss things so if you go to uh, put in the embodiment podcast into Facebook there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on so um, yeah I will reply to things personally there so um, also on embodiedfacilitator.com website uh, there's all sorts of freebies there there's videos there's free ebooks there's ebooks you can buy and of course, is our newsletter list. If you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embody Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embody Yoga Principles teacher training, then go to that website and you'll see a little pop up, and you can um, get the newsletter through there. Okay, so I think they're the main ones. Tell your friends, pay us some money on Patreon, give us a review on iTunes, 
uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list and get involved on the Facebook there. Whew, bit long. Uh, pick whatever you like that works for you. Until next time, welcome home to the body.